Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Navigating Uncertainty webinar brought to you by Cardano and Lincoln Pensions. My name is Stefan Lundberg, and I will be your host for the next 60 minutes. Today, Michael Bushnell from Lincoln Pension and Dana Day from Cardano will discuss how we can better navigate the uncertainty of both climate change and the current pandemic. But before we do that, I'd like to spend a few minutes reminding us of the conversation we had with Margaret Heffernan a couple of weeks before. Her main point is that in most situations, we are faced with uncertainty, that the world is largely unpredictable since we adjust and adapt as the future unfolds. And we should not rely too much on models because this can make us willfully blind to the reality. At best, models are tools that will help us organizing our thinking, that will help us to ask the right questions, but they should not be used for making decisions. Margaret's main point is that we don't know how the future will look like, so we should not plan for the future, but be prepared for it. For those of you who remembered the black box thinking uh, from a few years ago, Matthew Syed told us that most experts are as bad as the rest of us at predicting the future and probably even worse. So how can we deal with this? Well, I think we need to accept our human nature, that we do have biases and that we're prone to groupthink. We need to have diversity to deal with this. Diversity in thinking and also diversity in people. But that is not enough. We also need to have models that will help us to de-bias ourselves during our decision process. Today, we will explore scenario thinking, which is a very powerful tool. This means that instead of predicting the future, we create scenarios and we live through each of these scenarios, trying to figure out what decision should I make? What would the consequences be? And by doing that, we are living our scenarios, which means, as Harman Khan said, we are remembering the future, memento futuri. And this will make us better prepared to face an uncertain future. I think many of you already know Dana. She started a career in New York City, but relocated to the beautiful city of London about 14 years ago. Before joining Cardano, Dana worked for the CFA Institute, and she has a degree from Cornell University in psychology and sociology. What you probably don't know about Dana is that she loves sailing and spent a lot of time on the seven seas. Dana, it's time to weigh anchor. I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes answering the question, how can schemes employ scenarios to navigate economic recovery, consider their investment options, and prepare for future shifts or shocks? To do this, I'll introduce a set of three scenarios that Cardano is using to guide some of its thinking with regard to emerging from COVID. For each one, I'll talk about some of the data and circumstances we would expect to observe and what the implications are for familiar asset classes. I'll close with three tests to help determine if your strategy and portfolio are prepared to help your scheme navigate the road ahead. Little disclaimer, over the past 15 weeks of lockdown, I have attempted to put all of that former commuting and uh, evening time to good use. I hoovered up books. I'll reference a couple that have provided inspiration, but I'm happy to share a short list if you're interested after. You have in front of you a cartoon I found that just seems to fit this morning. And it captures the essence of scenario planning. Climate change shift is real. We'll hear from Michael in a few minutes, but we know the earth's temperature is rising. We really don't know what the weather is going to shock us with this weekend. It got me thinking. Linking this to the world of investments and portfolio theory, we rely so heavily on long-term historical data, mean reversion, correlation. We build models, we assign probabilities, we identify patterns and distributions, and we forecast for a single future. And you see that on the left-hand side of this page. But all that's pretty useless when it comes to preparing for just around the corner. If you will want to explore more on this one, John Kay and Merv King just put out their new book, March this year, called Radical Uncertainty, 
and it's worth a read. But what's the alternative? We challenge ourselves to think in scenarios. It's not easy because it's not definitive. Think in scenarios, you have to consider multiple plausible futures and prepare for all of them. This weekend, when you head out for a walk, what will you take with you? Sunglasses, a light jacket, an umbrella? Having lived in London now for 14 years, I can tell you, I take all three. Here's one of my favorite current examples of how our industry loves to model and define. No one can actually predict the exact path and shape of recovery, no one. It's a veritable alphabet soup. We have Bs, Us, Ws, Ls, and a swoosh for good measure. There's no pick one here because when markets are unstable, and they certainly are at the moment, investors act instinctively. It's constant cause and effect back and forth, but that throws the ability to predict short-term movements using long-term data patterns, throws it out the window. By the way, more great insights on this idea from author Andrew Lowe in his book called Adaptive Markets. The point is this, if we don't know and we can't predict the shape of the recovery, how do we make thoughtful, sound, defensible investment decisions. We get so wrapped up in industry and data and modeling probabilities and risk that we forget the basics. My colleague Phil Redding inspired the slide in a conversation last week. Now, for those of you who know Phil, you know he's sitting there laughing out loud hearing his name on a slide that shows Albert Einstein. But when he and I chat, I'm often reminded of this quote, Phil's wisdom like Albert's, is telling us to find the essence and be clear. So let's find the essence of economic recovery from COVID-19. What possible paths could we actually travel? This is Phil's question of what your scheme is invested in now, what is going to hold up under what circumstances, and what should you consider investing in so that you shore up any weak spots? Here's Cardano's take three plausible different scenarios. From left to right, quick bounce back with the sunshine, slow recovery with the clouds, and depression as stormy. Over the next three slides, we'll look at a few bits of data and circumstances that go into each scenario, and we'll explore what that means for investments. These slides are available to you after the webinar, um, but if you would like a copy of my speaking notes, and more detailed data charts behind my comments, please do email me and I'll be delighted to share and discuss. Before we go through our first scenario, I want to preface by saying it's not the accuracy of the scenarios, the inputs, or even the results that come through that are the most important. It's the process of thinking through each one that allows you to take investment decisions that will prepare you and your scheme, no matter what happens. And what's more, you'll be able to discuss and reflect thoughtfully on why you made the decisions that you did and learn. All right, let's talk about quick bounce back. I'll set the scene. Effective drugs are approved ahead of expectations, although we did not assume that one country buys them all in this particular model, but we'll talk about that later. Containment measures are eased rapidly around the world. Significant monetary and fiscal stimulus contains or is in place to mitigate defaults. Now, I've put some numbers on the page to indicate the type of observable, measurable inputs that can go into a scenario. Here, I'm looking at GDP growth and unemployment. We see a V-shape emerge. A couple characteristics here, stimulus firmly in place, investors are incentivized to buy risky assets. Rates remain close to zero, making equities attractive with high volatility. Now, developed equities outshine emerging in this case because supply chains localize and oil price remains low. Again, the data behind this is available after the webinar. The gap between economic and fundamentals, economic fundamentals and markets widens, but investors perceive, perceive that stimulus will continue to sustain asset prices. Inflationary pressures build. That's the scenario. So what assets fire up in a V-shaped quick bounce back recovery? Assets that do well, in high and low growth environments. Equities, careful credit, and perhaps even inflation protection. 
Moving on to slow recovery, the story isn't quite so rosy. In a nutshell, global economies are near-term recession. Containment policies continue on and off, lockdowns, Lester here and there. Gradual rebound of economic activity, again, continues to be supported by monetary and fiscal stimulus packages. Job losses, lower incomes, lost revenues, they all mount versus cost and cause some credit problems, really despite the unprecedented stimulus. In this case, we see the swoosh shape that so many have referred to over the past three months. GDP growth remains negative until well after lockdowns, plural, end, and unemployment remains elevated. It's really a decade of stagnation. Considering investments, assets do well in low growth environments they, they fire up here. These are really carefully selected corporate and high yield bonds and perhaps some high quality equities. And finally, depression. Not a great story. Countries are overwhelmed by COVID-19. Virus spread can't be contained. Lockdown becomes untenable. Global economies spiral into depression. Deflation sets in. High debt. Uh, in both corporate US corporate and European sovereigns cause a very deep recession with limited recovery. The dreaded L shape emerges. And considering investments, historically sound countries default on their debt, stock markets fall, credit spreads widen, investors flee to gold, cash, short-term government bonds, even accepting negative yields for an extended period. Put options on equities provide some protection. Now, the purpose of this scenario planning, like I said, is not to pick one, but instead to consider how to construct an investment strategy and portfolio that can handle any or all of them. So what do we need to invest in to make sure we have assets that fire up no matter what comes our way? Well, we need genuine diversification which not only includes the usual suspects, but a full, full toolkit that adds government bonds to the growth portfolio, downside equity protection, gold, inflation-linked bonds. These things make sure the portfolio can handle elements of the slow recovery and depression scenarios. On top of that, the ability to employ both active and passive strategies, work especially lower risk assets harder with leverage, use derivatives and private markets to get at things, to get at opportunities that a traditional allocation would leave on the table and dynamically adjust as markets, scenarios shift and change. Together, these leave a scheme prepared for whatever is waiting around that corner. Now, given that this talk is focused on COVID economic recovery, I've drawn inspiration from the daily Downing Street briefings and the tests applied to determine our readiness to emerge from lockdown. Here's my version. Here are three tests you can use to determine whether your investment strategy is ready to emerge and navigate the recovery. First, you're diverse. Second, you're using instruments and tools and techniques that allow you to flex and that allow you to run your portfolio efficiently. And effectively. And third, you either delegate or you do it yourself, but you can be dynamic and you can react and respond and adjust as you need so you're never caught off guard. In closing, we've looked at how you can use scenarios to make thoughtful, defensible investment decisions that will help your scheme navigate the recovery. And we've talked about the need for a full and dynamically adjusted investment toolkit to achieve the best possible results. Now, as I hand back to Stefan, I'll leave you with a final cartoon. I think there's a great truth in being able to put one foot in front of the other. Keep it simple, stay focused, keep moving forward, just for lunch. We have two eyes, one we keep on the long-term future and the other for what is just around the corner. Thanks, back to you, Stefan. Thank you, Dana. And what strikes me from your presentation is actually 
if you go back to your sailing background, is that we should hope for sunshine, but be prepared for a storm because both the weather and the markets can change quite quickly. So with that, I would like to shift back to Michael. I think what is interesting with the presentation is actually how will a sponsor be affected by climate change? And Michael, please uh, take it away. As an industry, pensions has made huge starting to think about ESG. As that's commonly cast, it's, it's an outward looking approach to thinking through our investment choices to promote those ESG factors in the world. But many stakeholders, and I include most pension trustees, have made very little progress in moving beyond that outward looking focus to looking inward at what is effectively their ultimate underpinning in the employer company. That's not just my thoughts. The IMF, the Bank of England, the UK government, many others are all beginning to see risk inherent in that outward looking approach where people don't turn around and have a think about what's right next to them and what's underneath them. As a result, climate change is perhaps the most widely ignored fundamental risk facing the sponsors. I'm going to talk about this issue a little bit for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes and think about how we might practically turn our attention to this as trustees and professionals. It's helpful to set this thinking in context. Why are we consistently ignoring such a fundamental issue? Why do we ignore any major issues? Willful blindness is quite an interesting concept here. There's many reasons for it, but I think in particular here, we've got three in operation. The first is a lack of clarity around how climate change might impact our world or our society or how it might play out. It makes it really hard to start thinking through problems too much, too many alternatives. Complexity around sponsors' own information um, in particular, the fact that they're not required to disclose their interconnected web of um, inputs and operational chains and value, and therefore makes it really hard for us to start to pick apart our sponsors themselves and think, well, where are the pinch points here? Where are the issues? And then our mistaken view that this is a future risk only makes it really easy for us to put this on the back burner for another day and imagine that it's something we can deal with down the line rather than now. So let's take those in order and see what we can do about those three points. First, climate change is not just a future problem. Let's stick with Japan, which was in Stefan's intro for me. It's a country I've been to every year since 2002, although not this year, um, probably. Um, in those 18 years, they've seen a sharp increase in the uh, volatility and frequency of summer typhoons. They've also seen in the last decade a 50% rise in landslides that cause massive destruction and uh, buildings to collapse, etc. And, and that's all caused by global warming, or at least that's the idea is that the extra heat that's put into the Western Pacific causes these localized weather patterns that cause major issues in Japan. Now, if that's true, why do we keep on thinking that climate change is someone else's problem? It's a problem for the future. And I think one of the major issues here is modeling. We rely too much on models. And too much of what we need is based on those models. And climate models are long-term. They look out 100 years into the future, 50 years into the future, and they look back 50, 100 years, and they draw out nice, smooth progressions into the future because that is what they are designed to do. They cut off the top, they cut off the bottom, they give you that smooth curve. But in practice, what we're going to see is much more like the chart on the right-hand side of your screen, a volatile progression from one stage to the next. In practice, climate change can quickly move from a chronic shift in temperatures to acute shocks through flooding, storms, heat stress, or 
through the imposition of legislation that is intended to avoid those issues. So they're not just a problem for tomorrow. I think we can also deal with complexity to some extent here. In unpicking complexity, framework and a systematic approach is really key. When we try and do it, what we think is, so what underpins a company or a group? So let's pull that apart. It's supply chain, that's critical. It's operations, where it makes things, where it does things. Those are its inputs really into the company. And then it's markets, where it sells, where it goes to market. And it's social factors in those regions, whether that's operations or whether that's more general in terms of markets or demand for product. Those are the outputs from the company. To illustrate, let's take company A. Company A is a global auto manufacturer. It sources key raw materials from South America, from China and Australia. Its main production takes place in the US, Eastern Europe and India. And its main markets are in the US, Europe and recently China. And of these, Europe is the bulk of profits. So now we have a picture of a company. We know where it does its business. We know how it gets its products. And we can start to think about are there alternatives? Are there other ways it might proceed and make it, and make itself survive or thrive? Now, we have a framework for the sponsor. So we need to wrangle climate information into some kind of clarity. Currently, the information on climate change tends to break into either two paragraphs of high level description or 50 pages of exegesis. And it can be very hard to try and pull this into something that you can think through as a normal human being and not an academic steeped in, in these issues. Where there is a lack of clarity, I think the best thing that we can do is to apply internally consistent but mutually exclusive scenario thinking, scenario thoughts that will allow us to pull out the differences and the weak points in these, in these scenarios. And no scenario will be right, but it will help you think through the problem and understand the potential issues that are about to arise. In this case, we suggest two scenarios. Let's bookend them. Let's take a high warming scenario where there is a low level of global policy response. And what we end up with is a, a very much warmer world, with CO2 much higher than it is currently. And a low warming world where the policy response is strong, robust, and consistent. We end up with lower warming, something in line with the Paris Accord, but much stricter rules and regulations. And then you can unpick that. So what is the impact of each of these? Where is the impact most severe? Is it uniform across the piece or are there pockets where it is harder than others? Is it avoidable? Could you move? Can you get away from it? And is the impact going to arise in the near, medium or long term or all across the board? So now we've got a little bit of clarity about the company, a little bit of clarity about the scenarios. Now you need to pull them together. At Lincoln, what we do is we have a bespoke model we've built with academics to try and get here. But however you do this is completely okay. The point is to try and start thinking through the problem. Here's my company, here's where it's based, here's my scenario. How are these two things coming together? And where are the stress points occurring? Bring this to life, let's take company A again. So we talked about it before and it's geographical spread. In the interest of time, we're just going to apply one of the two scenarios. We're going to do RCP 8.5, which is a high warming scenario here. Um, we can't take an hour to go through this as we would in a proper contingency planning workshop. But let's pick out some key thoughts here. So we're going to get material issues in production and delivery of raw materials in this scenario from, in particular, Australia and China, as they see extreme weather heat stress and issues with shipping brought on by 
increased storms at sea. We're going to see negative impacts on manufacturing, particularly in Eastern Europe, which is exposed to drought and heat shock. We're going to see a high degree of social pressure in Europe in particular, which is a key region where people are more socially aware of issues and more to avoid them. We're also going to see some negative impact in both the US and Europe on profits. We're going to see that as the economies there struggle to deal with these new heat stresses and the new world order that's brought on by those heat stresses. Is this scenario correct? Probably not. Is it based on the latest thinking we have? Yes. Does it help us think through those pressure points? I think it probably does. And then what do you do with that? Well, practical output from this has got to be joint planning. Most sponsors won't have done this. So for the trustee, the thought process is, do we need to worry? When are we going to be exposed to our government? Can we do something about it? Can we plan for it? Can we hedge against it? Can we work our investments more effectively to get around it? Or do we just need cash, like we would for any other issue that we see in part? And for the sponsor, how could they respond to these issues? Have they thought them through? Are they already responding? Have they demonstrated that they can be flexible like this in the past? Because that's key. Just saying we can change is not enough. There has to actually be the ability to change. And finally, what's the cost of not responding? Can we just leave it? Are both scenarios telling us we'll be okay either way? Can we just wait and see? Or would that leave it too late? So, Pulling this all together, the approach we've set out will not give you an indelible answer to climate change risk and its impact on your sponsor. But what it can be is a first step on the path to understanding the problem, working through it, planning for it, mitigating it, and if possible or necessary, funding it. Just like you would any other problem, from MA in an acquisitive company to possible recessions in your investments and your investment portfolio. And if we do all that, who knows? Sunny uplands, taking our head out the sand, might have worked us. Thank you very much for your patience. And Stefan, back to you. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I would say one thing I really got out of your presentation is that if you have a large concentrated risk that you cannot diversify away, you must really understand it in detail. And your sponsor's risk towards climate change is probably one of those really big ones. At this time, I think it's time to open up for Q&A. We have roughly 25 minutes where we can ask a lot of questions to, to Michael and Dana. And uh, therefore, I encourage you all, hit the chat function, type your name, type your question, and send it in. And Dana and Michael will answer them as good as we can. And I think we're going to have a lot of questions. So we're not going to be able to ask, answer all of them, but we will do our best. So let's start. I have a couple of questions here already. And this one is for Dana. It's from Richard. If one of the scenarios is a second spike, God forbid, what would you recommend, Dana? Well, it's, it's a great question because I think it's it's re relatively realistic, Richard. Um, we're seeing bits of that emerge all over the globe uh, and, and people and economies are responding in different ways. My advice to that would be go back to the basics. That's part of your scenario planning. Had you constructed or if you construct a portfolio that can weather those three scenarios you set out at the outset, you will be in a good position to handle these new spikes as they come up because they're built in. You've thought about that already. Thank you, Dana. I have another question here for Michael and no one put the name behind it. I don't know who it is, but the question is, to what extent should climate change impacts, real or modeled, uh, be used when doing the covenant review? I think it's a, it's a really good question. I think we have all lagged behind 
in picking up climate change as a key feature. I think we've all been too focused on it as a long-term issue and there are other things right in front of us. And I think it's something we need to be building in from here on. These need to be thought processes that we pick up. Now, some industries will be much more exposed than others. Some sponsors will be much more exposed than others. I'm not saying that everybody is exposed equally, but the process of going through it, planning for it, is, I think, really important to any trustee. Thank you, Michael. Now, the following question is for both panelists, so both Michael and Dana. And the question is, what type of practical actions are you seeing trustees taking in response to this risk? So let's start with Dana. Right. It, it's exactly, they, they, take a, they take a sheet of paper and they work with their advisors and they say, what could happen? And are we prepared? Now that question comes in a lot of different forms. It often relies on models and data and which is, which is, which is one approach. And we've talked a little bit about that. But what I'm seeing trustees do is think through scenarios and, and start to say, where are we exposed? Michael? Thank you, yeah. I think this goes back to the previous question as well. I think contingency planning here is the key output. It's the sitting down with the whole trustee board, sponsor, advisors, and working, what are our tools? What are we most worried about? Can we do something about that now? And that is that for me is is the key thing that I've seen people doing. And the more we can do it, the better people prepare and everybody will win. So so basically the most important question as a trustee you should ask is what if? Yeah, and Stefan, if I can add, it's not it's not the inputs, right? We we spend so much time. And, and I do see a lot of trustees and trustee boards making this, this mistake. We, we spend so much time trying to perfect the inputs and it's not necessarily the inputs that have to be perfect. It's the thinking through them and what could happen that is much more important for making decisions that protect your scheme. Thank you, Dana. I have another question here for you, Dana, as well. And it says, some market commentators say that many of us over diversify. What is the case for and against concentration slash conviction? Well, I, I, I'll answer that in a slightly different question or a different way. I think um, over diversification, I mean, you can have law of diminishing return, right? That's completely normal. But I think when, when you're diversified, it's not, it's not diversification for the sake of diversification. It's diversification putting things together that behave differently when you run them through scenarios so they can use that to cover gaps. And so the, the, the key bit there though is, is you have to be dynamic, right? This, this, this long-term, this old style thinking perhaps of, of long-term strategic asset allocation, set it and forget it. You can be diversified, but that's not really gonna solve the problem if you can't flex and bend and twist to respond to what's coming out as new information comes out and these scenarios that you've designed. Hope that helps. I think Dana and someone said, actually not taking new information into account is probably the, the worst thing you can do as a, a decision maker. Michael, I have a question for you. I think this is quite a personal question from someone. It says, what is the biggest lesson you have learned on your journey uh, towards uh, climate change? Wow, that is a great question. Um, the biggest, my biggest learning is that actually there is no clear answer available at this point. The issues that we're dealing with in climate change are too broad. The information available is too scattered at this point in time. And actually, what we need to be doing is doing our best as trustees, as professionals, and as people dealing with climate change on a day-to-day -day basis and what we do with the climate, we need to be working to do our best with what we have 
And I think that the scenario of testing is, is a key way of doing that. Not the only way, but it is a key way of doing that because it can help you grasp all of that disparate issues. Thank you, Michael. I have a sort of a different question here, which I think is quite interesting. It's from Colin Marsh. I think it goes to both of you. Is a second term of Donald Trump in the White House part of any of your scenarios? Dana, as Colin, an American, Colin. Man, yeah, enlighten us. <laughs> so I, I knew that this, thank you. First of all, thank you for asking because I'm, this, this question is inevitable. Um, God help us all. But um, I think I'll, I'll go back to the tools that we talked about this morning, right? So I've, I've run, we've run scenarios this morning to talk about COVID-19 recovery. It would be foolish of pension schemes not to run socio-political scenarios that account for, I would say, a, a Trump re-election. And I, I can opine on whether I think that's possible, but that's not really why you've asked me to be here. Um, but, but more importantly, social change and unrest that, that could potentially come out of the environment we're in right now. Right, we're in a really interesting pressure cooker. I put my psych hat on for a sec. Got people who've been in their homes, locked down with families for 15 weeks. We've got growing gap between haves and have nots as people continue to lose their jobs. We've got poor leadership, arguably, not visionary leadership in a lot of world, big world economies. Just those three things alone mean that we have some really serious sociopolitical scenarios to think through. And Donald Trump 100% is a part of that. Thank you. Uh, Michael, do you want to say something as well in terms of climate change? I suppose, Stefan, all I'd say is I think that's the high warming scenario. Yeah. Well, we have to hope for the best. Um, there was a question here from someone uh, who said, in Margaret Heffernan's webinar, she contrasted scenario planning with preparedness, which is most relevant here. And I think I will answer that one because what Margaret said is that being prepared is what you can become when you use scenario planning. So it's a tool for increasing your preparedness by living through the different scenarios. You, you sort of get a feeling on how the world could develop. So the point is scenario planning to be prepared. There's a question now from David Fogarty, and he is directed to Dana. Uh, he, he writes, the challenge with your portfolio thinking is that by aiming to weather everything, you muddle along in each three, but struggle to get good returns if outturns are possible. You also end up with significant complexity and cost, which is hard for trustees to understand. Dana, what's your reaction? I think, I mean, look, you make, you make uh, those are great points. I think there are two things in particular that you can do to combat those. Because that's a risk, right? If you're prepared for everything and you're kind of mediocre. Well, two things. First one is the toolkit that you use. You can, you can augment in some places and dial back in others. So that even though you're, you're still fully diversified, you're using things like leverage and, and derivatives to get at corners of the market where you can eke out that extra return, even though you remain fully diversified across the board. And then the second one in terms of cost, that depends, right? If you find good um, sector, and I should say technical expertise in, in the spaces of some of these instruments, then it's actually quite cost effective. What's more is, is the link between using derivatives and liquidity. Because what happens is you don't tie up your cash, so you can actually put it to work harder. And if you and if you and if you do that with a partner who has good counterparty relationships, you do that. It actually it's quite cost effective. Um, so, yeah, those are risks. I think that's a good question, but there are ways of overcoming those risks. Thank you, Dana. I have a question for Michael. The question is: It seems trustees effort on ESG is very focused currently on investments. Are you saying the covenant industry has been willfully blind about ESG and climate change? Michael? I think probably that the covenant industry has been blind to climate change. I think part of that is 
not knowing where to start. Go back to my three issues. Where do you start when you start pulling these problems together? And it's taken us a lot of thinking to get here to this place where we've used this with clients and we've, you know, we're in an embryonic form and it's ready to go. It's hard. Um, ESG is a lot easier. There are big indices set up that tell you these are goods for ESG and these are not. And these are really bad. I have to say, when you dig into them, I'm not entirely sure that I agree with all of those metrics, but that's, that's for another webinar. Um, I think that the climate uh, change issue is something that covenant reviewers will have to catch up with, and so will trustees. And it's important that trustees and other advisors all work together to move this up the agenda. Thank you, Michael. And I would like to add to that, that actually with climate change, we're gonna see real consequences on the profitability of business and gonna impact the current business model. So when you're trying to analyze your sponsor, it's as important as looking at other risk influencing the business. Uh, here comes another question regarding ESG. And the question is, there is, as today, much focus on climate change. And, and the person says, that's perfectly fine. But a good deal of focus on governance, especially voting. But what about S in ESG? How relevant is this factor from an investment perspective? Do our speakers think that the social aspects of corporate behaviors are really important? Uh, Dana, can you address this one? Sure, I'll, I'll tell you what first comes to my mind. Um, social is, it, it is important. And I would say social, in many ways, we are further along, just hear me out, than some of the other E and G fact, well, G is, is one, but social, if you think about what's built in, and I'll go back to the, to the CFA, to the Chartered Financial Analyst curriculum here, social board, uh, board construction and membership, um, diversity issues related to that, diversity challenges related to that, in some ways is already built into financial analysis of companies. Um, now, I get, I get that's a little bit tenuous and we could do more, but the, but the foundations are there and it's very closely tied to good governance. Thank you, Dana. If I can pick that up from a covenant perspective as well. Yeah, jump in. Thank you. From a covenant perspective, it's a really interesting question. Because when you're a covenant assessor looking at an employer, you're, you're almost agnostic about those social factors except as they go to affecting the sponsor because that's what we're asked to do but that is an effect and it does have to be taken into account so social demand for products social standing of a company whether it is whether it's pro whether it is you know something that people are going to buy or not and how society views that type of company going forward are going to be key aspects of the long-term trends in the covenant. And if I can bring this to sort of a journey planning point, when you're looking at the furthest reaches of your journey plan and you're thinking about your end state, well, that's when these factors become super important because they are the ones that will determine the long-term performance when the near-term performance might be much more financially based, market-based. So we do bring it in, do we bring it in as much as we might? I think we could probably expand that as well. I think we probably will as time goes on. Can I just say, um, Michael, that's a brilliant comment and you've got me thinking, I think it's worth mentioning, hopefully here, uh, another book, forgive me, but um, brilliant, brilliant study of demographics and how they impact trade and economics, really tight story. It's called Disunited Nations by Peter Zian. And the gentleman who asked about the Trump re-election, um, this, you, I think this is a great book for you. Um, you. You have to take it with a pinch of salt because it's quite US centric, but man, it's, it's, a good, it's a good read. Thank you for that tip, Dana. And here's another question, which kind of relates to the cost of ESG and it says, ESG is often discussed as either cost or a question of mitigating risks. Is there a more bullish case to be made instead, where scenario or data insights actually points to opportunities? 
Dana, what's your view? Yeah, um, I, I have a chart in my head that I will happily share after, but if you look at just recent or even longer term performance of ESG indices versus non-ESG indices, you've got to follow the money. And, and ESG indices are gaining momentum. ESG friendly investment strategies are where people are, are investing. And so you'd be foolish not to, not to understand what's going on there. Use that dynamic. Thank you. I have another question here, which is going back to the pandemic. And it says, in the United Kingdom, the National Risk Register has since 2008 put pandemic influenza as the highest relative impact risk and one of the higher relative likelihood. Why did more of us do not do the same, including many of our politicians and civil servants, and I would add investors? Uh, Dana? I have a flippant answer. Um, my flippant answer is, why do people still smoke? Why do they still eat cheeseburgers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Um, we are really good at, as humans at being making decisions around short-term risks and challenges we can see, feel, taste, hear. We are terrible at making long-term strategic decisions. So when, when you know, risk register after risk register pandemic show up, we can't see it. Is it really there? That's again, I'll go back to scenario planning. That's why running these things through scenario and saying, well, yeah, it could happen. We don't think it's going to, but let's be prepared. And I would add to that, Dana, that in uh, many cases, being prepared is also going to cost inefficiency because it means you can deal with things that you hadn't foreseen and it requires a bit of fat in the system and the more we become lean mean and efficient the bigger is the risk that we also be hit by something unexpected i think so, our time just, is michael has a comment oh michael please go ahead one second which is just to say that from an employer covenant perspective that's often the argument that we are in for the trustees with the sponsor efficiency versus protection, security, and fat in the system. And that's what we're trying to go for, but a lot of sponsors would rather have the efficiency. When you go through one of these shocks, you see why we push for these protections. So basically you're saying a, management, a good management actually look at both short-term and long-term and not just over-prioritize one of them. And, and just one a, more. Precisely. Dana, go ahead. One more for me. And I, I think David answer, or asked this question earlier about diversification and giving up some of the upside, I think one could argue that a slow, you know, from an investment perspective, a slow, consistent, reliable string of returns, even if, even if slightly lower than, hey, shooting the sky out, is much more effective at getting a scheme to where it wants to be long-term than kind of the, the interim yo-yo, one, one could argue. And that's, and that's really that, that efficiency versus preparedness trade-off. Thank you, Dana. I have a final question, uh, and that is to both of you. If there's one thing that you would like people to take away after this webinar, what would that be? So, Michael, I would ask you first. So, I think people should take away that no problem is too big to think through. Nothing is too difficult to plan for. You can get there. And the process of trying is its own reward and will help you be prepared for what comes to the line. Like my hotspot. Thank you, Michael. And Dana, I would like to hear your point, but uh, no, a different point than Michael's. Okay. Um, after the webinar finishes, grab a blank sheet of paper, put down three scenarios that you want to think about, whether they're sociopolitical, climate change, COVID recovery, not, not fussed, and then use that as a way to sift and sort through. I don't know about you all, but I get, I get more emails about webinars and blogs and chats and articles every day about all of these topics. Use that as a way to sift the information that comes in, sort them into scenarios, and then sit down as a, as a trustee board and say, let's, let's try and process some of what we're hearing from the experts and, and figure out how to use it ourselves.
Okay, I think it's time for wrapping up. And I would like to thank both Michael and Dana for sharing these important thoughts with us. So I give you a big applause. <laughs> Needless to say, if you in the audience have any further questions or your question wasn't answered uh, in this Q&A session, or you want to know how resilient is my scheme with respect to climate change and pandemics, please do not hesitate to contact either Michael or Dana directly. Finally, I would like to thank all of you on behalf of Cardano and Lincoln Pensions for spending your precious time with us today. We hope to see you soon, and more importantly, stay safe. Thank you.